I got a okay I got a message saying unknown error has occurred. But anyway, um, let me start off just by saying how I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to talk to the Socialist History Society. Um, and I particularly want to thank David Morgan, who uh, made the original invitation. Um, it's about, uh, it's been billed as about my new book, um, Perfidious Albion, written in the Spanish Civil War. But I want to say also a little bit about the publishers. It's published by a wonderful, uh, relatively new publisher, the Clapton Press, which specializes in the Spanish Civil War and is very closely connected to the uh, International Brigade Memorial Trust, which is a wonderful uh, organization, which uh, I believe should have all the publicity uh, that it can possibly get. Um, I just wanted to say that. Um, I also need to say a little bit of, about the title of the of the talk and of the book. Um, can I just stress that um, the Albion in question is not West Bromwich, um, but is actually the UK. Um, but people might think I'm talking about uh, West Bromwich because, or West Bromwich Albion, because people who know me know I'm a lifelong and therefore miserable Evertonian. And the, one of my most um, depressing memories is the 1968 Cup final, uh, which we were beaten by West Bromwich Albion late on in extra time by a Jeff Astle goal. Uh, and, but that's not what I'm, that's not what this is about. This is actually uh, a reference to a phrase that was. I, I believe, coined in the 13th century, but became very popular in France during the French Revolution when it was a reference to the well-known hostility uh, of Great Britain to the French Revolution. And it, the book has three main themes. The first is actually about the, um, what would, I mean, it's a reflection on the fact that during the Spanish Civil War, uh, official British foreign policy was <laughs> demonstrably duplicitous, perfidious, and that the high-minded projection of the British policy uh, known as the non-intervention uh, agreement. But non-intervention, although projected as an initiative to prevent uh, an international war, actually had the, uh, the consequence of favouring the victory of General Franco. Now, of course, it is uh, central to the conventional wisdom about the Spanish Civil War, that um, it was really the assistance that came from the Axis powers, from Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, and there's a, an added view that some people regard the uh, defeat of the Spanish Republic as to do with a betrayal by, by Stalin. I think that, that's a view that uh, we owe in, to a very large extent to George Orwell's homage to Catalonia. One of the chapters in the book actually sets out to show that um, Orwell's much vaunted reputation as somebody who was perpetually uh, honest and truthful uh, is not entirely backed up by an analysis of homage to Catalonia. Um, so that's the, one of the themes is, is about the, uh, the perfidy of British foreign policy uh, during the Civil War. 
Another is a, a contrasting theme with, with some of the chapters in, in the law, which reflects in fact um, the amazing work done by the British left, um, the aid Spain movement, ordinary, ordinary people who couldn't really afford it, but who contributed everything they could financially to sending humanitarian aid to the Spanish Republic. Of course, the bravery of the many British volunteers um, in the international brigades and the astonishing contribution of many British nurses and doctors who helped, um, in a sense, create, or they, they were central to the creation of the Spanish Republic's medical services. I think all of those, I think all of those contributions reflected the fact that there were many people who were in, I mean, not just in, in Britain, but certainly there were many people in Britain who realized that the threat, the threat of fascism in Spain, that what was going on, what was happening in Madrid, the bombing of Madrid, that if fascism was not, the threat of fascism was not stopped in Spain, it would soon be unleashed upon France. And how true was that? And eventually on London. And so that's, if, if you like, the, the second um, the second theme of the book. The third is really to, it's to do with the culture wars. And that, like the other two, of course, has echoes um, in today's politics. And the, it says a lot, it, 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 it looks into the way in which perceptions of the Spanish Civil War, post-war perceptions, after the, after 1945, were actually manipulated, but quite deliberately, by two organizations in the United States, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was financed by the CIA, and whose mission was to um, effectively to it was totally, I needless to say, anti-Soviet, but it, it, one of its themes was that the Spanish Civil War had actually been the jewel in the crown of communism during, the, during that period. Um, and therefore, the memory of the Spanish Civil War had to be destroyed. And this was paralleled in the UK by an outfit called the Information Research Department, which was part of the Foreign Office. Um, it was masterminded by the, um, the British Security Services. And its mission was explicitly stated by one of its directors when he said, such a huge, or something along these lines, anyway, this is not the exact quote, but basically a huge effort was made when we needed the Soviet Union as an ally to convert Stalin into the friendly Uncle Joe. And this is now about the effort necessary to undo that and basically to create the idea of Stalin as a monster and, and the great threat. So they're the, they're the, three, um, the three basic themes that I think, uh, I hope are reflected in the chapters of this book. And I would argue that they all, in a sense, underline the, um, 
the axiom, the famous axiom, um, those who do not know their history are doomed to make the same mistakes. And I think this, this is a, a, a two-way street that um, it, it's absolutely the case that um, all, his, all writing of history is very much influenced by contemporary, the contemporary values, contemporary events, contemporary perceptions. And I would re readily admit that's absolutely the case with all of my, of, of my work. But it, it, it's a two-way street and it, it reflects backwards it, on, onto contemporary politics. And I think we saw that most recently with the uh, polemics that, that uh, were provoked by Gary Lineker's uh, comment that the present Tory policy of um, denouncing immigrants as um, a danger as, as a, a, a danger to to Britain that this had re reflections of how the um, the Nazis um, built up or created uh, the way in which if you like the route to power um, so these are all the things that the, the book tries to cover. Um, um, I'm, I hope it was clear um, in the, if, if any publicity that there may or may not have been for, for this event, that um, it was my hope that a very short introduction by me would be followed by the event being opened up to a question and answer uh, session in which here I am um, and I'm trying to answer any questions that anyone has throw at me. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And you actually, because of the, the techie problems at the beginning, you actually uh, sp started speaking before I was able to introduce you. Um, but you really don't really need any introduction, I'm sure, but you are currently a pr professor um, in the in the, the, in, the international history uh, department at the London School of Economics, and have um, probably uh, written uh, far more books on uh, Spain and the Spanish Civil War than uh, any of us have read. Um, so, uh, and probably the most eminent uh, uh, writer in, in English language on on Spain, I'm sure. Um, I mean, thanks for coming back uh, to us. You've spoken for us twice before, and also contributed to one of the Socialist History Society's early occasional. Uh, publications and and thanks for sort of giving a brief introduction uh, to the themes of your your book, which is a series of essays, which uh, I would certainly recommend uh, everybody to get and to read. We've got a couple of questions or points already appearing in the chat, um, but um, uh, those are actually answered by very fully actually in the book. But we will uh, come on to questions in a moment. Steve Cushion, did you want to say something about the technical issues? Because some people still seem to be struggling with audio, though mine is fine. Uh, no, uh, actually, if anyone who is not actually speaking, if they could turn their video off, uh, that would be a great help as it's as it will reduce the any bandwidth problems that may exist so that we uh, 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 so that we can hear and hear and see Paul. Uh, uh, better, uh, but uh, uh, I, there's not much more I can do about it than that. It's yeah. uh, we're, we are at the mercy of the internet. Uh, I, I had put my hand up to ask a question. More okay, can I just say in a, in a second, but, um, just to uh, introduce can... myself? Sorry, um, I am I'm Duncan Bowie. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Socialist Society and therefore chairing this uh, event. Um, if you can all stay muted until I call your names. Um, it's best um, to put your hands up using the reactions button uh, on the Zoom system at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if not, um, put your video on and wave at me and I'll take you in order. But we do need to keep questions, although we've got lots of time because Paul's introduction has been relatively short. Um, but we've got lots of time. But please keep your questions 
um, uh, fairly short uh, and uh, no lectures from uh, other people, please, other than from our, our, our speaker. Uh, Steve Cushion um, was first. So, Steve. Uh, yes, I, uh, I, I was going to ask, ask you this this afternoon before I read the first chapter of your book in which in which you you do sort of answer it but on the basis that probably most people haven't read uh, the first chapter of your book yet i wanted to ask uh, to what extent was the non-intervention policy uh, by uh, 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 by the british and french governments a deliberate tactic to give the francoist forces the best chance of winning uh, uh, and uh, i mean because i i asked this in the light of the the pro-fascist bent of most of the British and French bourgeoisie uh, at the time, uh, and uh, uh, I, I mean, it's hard to uh, uh, it's hard to be definitive about this. But your uh, your views on on how deliberate this was would be uh, uh, would be of interest. Okay, Paul. That actually, I think is it, it's quite difficult to to, to provide proof that. Um, you know, policymakers were actually say, you know, we, we've we've got to um, ensure that that Franco wins. But there's an, an awful lot of on you know unspoken prejudice. Um, I think it's it's relatively easily um, shown that class prejudice. Sorry, class prejudice. Uh, took precedence over strategic interests. And I think the best proof of this, or the best evidence, is actually Winston Churchill. There's a wonderful book by Churchill called Step by Step, which it, it's really a collection of his newspaper articles over, over the period of the Spanish Civil War. And the title, of course, reflects the evolution of his own views. And basically, the early articles start off saying, um, in, in, in Spain, um, there's evidence of aristocrats being, being assassinated. And since I'm an aristocrat, I inevitably sympathize with the, with the Spanish rebels. By the end of the war, he's actually writing that because my sort of my central priority in life is, is the survival of the British Empire, I've come to the conclusion that the interests of the British Empire lie with support for the Spanish Republic. Because, of course, he, unlike it, apparently um, Neville Chamberlain and Lord Halifax and many of the policymakers of, 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 of the Tory party, uh, had perceived that the actual motive of both Hitler and Muslim, or the central motive, I mean, both of them had uh, quite a kaleidoscope of, of, of motives, but their central one was to weaken Anglo-French hegemony of international relations, and in a sense to, to prepare the way for the Second World War, for what they intended to do in the Second World War. And I think that is pretty easily demonstrated. I mean, it, the, um, it, it's interesting to note that there is evidence in German diplomatic documents, Italian diplomatic documents, Portuguese diplomatic documents, um, that it, it was an absolute conviction of the policymakers of the Axis that deep down uh, the British government was very happy to see Franco win, and a lot of a lot of that conviction came from the fact that um, Portugal, which was always considered, of course, um, the oldest ally, that nothing was done um, by the British, and that this is very obvious in the in the Portuguese documents and the the memoirs of, of uh, Portuguese policymakers that. Um, you know, that this was the case, that there, there was real sympathy in London for the, the cause of the... Of, of the you know, so for it was also the case that 
uh, certainly the City of London uh, facilitated credit for the um, for arms purchases um, for the the Franco rebels. Um, so yeah, I mean I could talk for hours about this, but I, I think that answers your question, Steve. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, who wants to come in next? Uh, I can't see any hands up at present. There are a couple of points being raised in chat, um, so I'll I'll pick those up now. Um, there's a, a question um, from uh, Riyad Akbar about um, the issue of your comments on uh, George Orwell and homage to Catalonia, which I know is covered very fully uh, in in the book. So I don't know whether Riyad's read that essay yet. But do you want to comment on your discussion of uh, homage to Catalonia and Orwell? I'm oh, very happy to. Um, I mean, I think that homage to Catalonia is possibly, probably in fact, the single most read book about related to the Spanish Civil War. And it's arguably, if not the most influential, I think it, it, it's one of the most influential. Now, there are many wonderful things about Honest to Catalonia um, as a reflection of the uh, what it was like to be an ordinary volunteer um, at the front, what it was like to be fighting for the Republic and so on. It, it is unparalleled, and, 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 and that is, um, you know, that's among its merits. However, there's an awful lot that, if you like, distorts the reality of, of, of the situation. And there are elements of it that are not entirely honest. So, for instance, um, in, in my chapter in the book, I cite a, a letter that he wrote to Cyril Connolly, in which basically he said, uh, I think probably I, um, I I was far too sympathetic to the pool. Um, and it was really in a kind of spirit of cricket, you know, fair play. I, I didn't think they were getting a fair crack of the whip from um, most, of, most of the press at the time. Well, the, that, of course, uh, the view that he expresses in the book, um, it's belied, for instance, by his, uh, his essay, Looking Back on the Spanish Civil War. There are also things in which um, he implies that he, he has conversations in Spanish and Catalan, and they're two languages that he categorically did not know. And therefore, you know, it, 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 it's... it's quite difficult not to to wonder about the um, the veracity of other things um, and is the way in which um, he sees his perception of what are known as the the May days what you know the in the sense the, the period that is covered in Ken Loach's film Land and Freedom, again, they rather distort the, the you know, the, the, the what, you know, 50 years of research have, have rather shown that, that um, basically what, what he, sort of what he defends, champions in the book is actually, and, and it's, um, suppression by the Republican authorities is because it was actually undermining the Republican war effort. And again, that's another story I could devote an hour to, but uh, for the moment, can I just say it's all in the book. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I've got David Morgan next. David. In yourself. Hi there, Paul. Great, great to see you again. I think last time we met was at Bishopsgate, uh, when we had that your book on the Spanish Holocaust. I remember that title was a bit controversial at the time, 
uh, the use of the word Holocaust, but I think it was justified in the scale of the uh, atrocities committed under Franco. Uh, on that issue, could you maybe say something about the uh, difficulties of doing research uh, of of the Franco regime, given that the uh, I imagine a lot of the documents were either suppressed or destroyed or deliberately not kept. Uh, I'd just be quite interested in uh, in the question of archival research of Franco's long reign in Spain. And uh, I may have some other questions if, if there's a stony silence. <laughs> Thank you very much anyway at this stage, Paul. Okay, Paul. <laughs> You've actually asked a, a truly gigantic question. I mean, the, the, what I try to do in, well, let me first of all say that the, the use of the term Holocaust in the, um, in the title of the book was, no, was not meant to usurp the use of the word in reference to the atrocities suffered by the Jewish people during the Second World War. Of course not. I mean, one of the points that uh, is often made is that the origins of the word Holocaust, which come, you know, come from the ancient Greek and means, you know, holos, burnt, from, we all know from, um, you know, complete and kaustos, so it's this kind of burnt offering. It, it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of has connotations of sacrifice. And there are a lot of Jewish historians and thinkers who think it's far more appropriate to use a word like shoah, which, which in uh, Hebrew means catastrophe. And of course, there are many, many differences uh, between what Franco did and what Hitler did. And a lot of to do with the fact that um, Franco's activities were limited to the geographic, you know, to the, the geographical territory of that part of Spain that he controlled progressively during the Civil War and then all of Spain after the war, as against Hitler, who, of course, had control of most of the continent of Europe. So there, there are big differences there. In terms of research, the what I tried to do in, in, in the book was to show equally the fate of innocent civilians on both sides during the Civil War. And... One of my conclusions was that there were huge differences. And they, these differences can be classified into qualitative differences and quali qualitative differences. Now, the, the quantitative, um, obviously, are about the, the numbers of, of the victims on both sides. And as I repeat endlessly in both at there and elsewhere, in order to name the victim, or in order to number the victims, you need the names. Now, in the case of the victims of Republican violence, not, I hasten to add, of the Republican government, I'll come on to that in a second, The victims of violence in the Republican zone at the time were actually the Republican authorities tried to name them to, if you like, to, well, to identify them. So that was, that was the first effort that was made. When the Francoists took over each area. They made a huge effort to use the what they could find about about victims in in order to use these as 
instruments of um, provocation, if you like. The results of all of this were produced finally in a great national enterprise that was that took place um, once Franco was in power, called La Causa General, which was um, a massive investigation, which reached figures that were wildly beyond um, what has now been shown to be the case. But it is possible because of the um, the existence of the records that went into the the confection, if you like, of the confect the causa general to arrive at pretty accurate figures. And basically we can say with a fair degree of, of confidence that the victims that of the uh, the, the, the Francoist victims, clergy, uh, Francoist soldiers, and so on, capitalists, those who were perceived by the Republican populace as supporting the uprising, are 50,000, give or take, maybe 100 on either side, 100 more, 100 less. In contrast, the Republican victims of the Francoist repression are much more difficult to identify for all kinds of reasons. First of all, um, they took place in areas where people were, were fleeing from the, um, the, if you like, the, um, the instruments of terror that were being unleashed by, by the Francoists. And in those days, they didn't have identity uh, papers. So they were often killed far, far away from their places of origin. That made it very difficult. Um, there were also places where um, the foreign press was excluded. Um, there were no um, diplomatic represent representatives of uh, the Western powers in, um, those in, in, in the Francoist zone. So that, that kind of distorted things. However, as a result of massive research done by local historians, it has been possible to identify at least 130,000. Now, because there are considerable areas that have not even, where no investigation has taken place at all. For post-war uh, political reasons, it is reasonable to extrapolate that the, that the victims of, of Francoist terror must, be, must have been at the very least 150,000, that's to say three times as many. Now there are, if you like, qualitative reasons for this. And the most obvious is that the Francoist repression, the repression against um, Republicans, was an official instrument of policy. And that is easily proven. Um, and I produced the documents in, in, in the book. Whereas in the Republican zone, the, the victims were much more the result of spontaneous acts of retaliation, reprisal, uh, because of news that was was coming in of the um, of, of the scale of the terror in the in the opposing zone. So, yeah, I, I try to defend, if you like, or to explain, to justify um, in the book by explaining the, uh, the difference in um, research possibilities um, and the research criteria that went into the, the investigation and into both sides.
Thanks, Paul. Who wants to go next? I can't see any hands up. Uh, yes, all right. Andy Whitlett. Midget. You need to unmute. Hello, good evening. Could I just, um, can you hear me okay? Good yeah. evening, Paul. Right. Um, yeah, I'd just like to follow that up in, on the same theme, really. How successful do you think the um, the current law that's still in vigour, the um, historical memoria, isn't it? Um, do you think that's been successful? Has it been in vigour for 10 years, 15 years? And um, has it helped your research in this, on these themes? I mean, I think it could be summed up as too little, too late. Yeah. That, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and, and in both cases, they've been, um, I, obviously, I'm talking about the, the first one, the first law in 2006, and the, the more recent one. And in both cases, of course, they've been stymied by financial considerations that um, there has been a tendency um, to, if you like, leave the solution of these things to local authorities, you know, to, to local municipalities. And one of the, going back to what I was saying a minute ago about the need to identify the dead and so on, that requires complex and very expensive processes of excavation, DNA testing, and so on. And, and that is really very, very expensive. And, and it's, it's largely required volunteer work, volunteer contributions, and so on. I mean, there have been some, what one might call triumphs in the sense that, um, like uh, propaganda triumphs. So the, um, I mean, one of the, one of the um, issues that I think has always been regarded as quite scandalous is that um, in, in Spain, there has been very little done, I mean, to, to if you like, I'm not quite sure I can put this. I mean, there, is, there has never been any truth and reconciliation committees. And the, um, in, 19, 1997, there was um, a, what is often considered as the, um, the law of the, 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 the pact of forgetfulness, and that's often cited as that, that that's more than enough. But actually, um, it had it, it, it was basically a, a civic pact. Uh, it was an amnesty law that um, decreed that there could be no judicial proceedings taken against those who were guilty of crimes against humanity committed in defense of the so-called previous regime, or as the, the Franco regime, or those who had committed acts of terrorism against that regime. So that meant... Um, for instance, ETA, the, 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 the Basque Independence Organization. And one of the things that the, um, you know, the when this started to be all, all to be questioned, was really about the turn of the century when it was basically the grandchildren of the victims who started to the test and to look for answers and, 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 and so on. And one of the things that used to um, just, you know, infuriate commentators was the fact that how could it be possible that in, in a country that was trying, uh, allegedly trying to heal the wounds of a civil war, there could exist a government-financed organization 
called the Fundación Nacional Francisco Franco, you know, the, the, the National Foundation, Francisco Franco Foundation, which um, basically uh, contained, you know, it was a, a foundation devoted to the memory of General Franco. And it was considered inconceivable that in Germany, there would be a Stiftung Adolf Hitler, you know, the idea of a, an Adolf Hitler foundation. And, and why was that? What was the difference? Well, the difference was that in the countries, the, the, the Axis countries that had been defeated by the Western allies, there had been processes of denazification. But because Franco was never ousted from power, such a process did not take place. And during the years of the Franco regime, a, a, a regime which was in many respects, a it was a regime of pillage, it was also a regime of terror. But one of the things that took place was a, a national brainwashing aimed at persuading the bulk of the population that uh, what Franco had done had saved Spain from the claws of Moscow and so on. Now, when Franco died and democracy came back, that was not challenged inevitably by uh, a national brainwashing in favor of the other side. After all, one of the, uh, the key elements of democracy is free speech. So those who had come to believe in the, um, the merits of, of Franco were able to, to go on doing so. And that this was reflected in the success of political parties like the Partido Popular, which is a, a very right of center party, and now a very explicitly pro center populist party called Vox. So um, I think this, to, an, to a large extent, tells you how successful the laws of historical memory have been. Okay, uh, thanks, Paul. I can't see any hands up, so I'll take a question from the chat. Uh, what contemporary Spanish writers on the Civil War would Paul recommend? What, sorry? Could what, con again? what contemporary Spanish writers on the Civil War would you recommend? Do they need to have been translated? <laughs> can I... Can I can the writer, can, can Angus McSwan speak, read Spanish? Okay, go with, go with the ones that are translated what I'm trying first. To say is obviously there are some well, absolutely... well, yeah, I, I, can, I can read Spanish, but I think it, it's a good point. Yeah, works available in English too. There are some wonderful, truly wonderful historians of the Spanish Civil War in Spain. Probably. The most prominent is a man called Anco Vinas, who is a, a great historian of, of the international dimension of the Civil War. But unfortunately, his books are, of, I mean, for the, our purposes today, unfortunately, his, his many and absolutely crucial books are available only in Spanish. Someone else is uh, um, somebody called Julian Casanova, who, um, in fact, is met, several of his books are available in English, um, and he's taught in um, he's taught quite a lot in American universities. Um, there is also um, a very important historian called Enrique Moradiellos, who is. Um, very distinguished historian who um, did some of his training here in, in, in London. Um, and quite a few of his books are available in English. But there is no shortage of, I mean, once upon a time, I mean, when I started research, um, obviously books about the Spanish Civil War that were available I started my research in Spain in the late 1960s. And of course, 
what was available was largely propaganda for the Franco regime. That has changed dramatically now, and there are some very wonderful um, historians, Spanish historians, uh, whose work I would urge people, if they can, to read. Many, no doubt, referenced in Paul's own work, so <laughs> that will be a route to them. Um, OK, uh, does anybody else want to contribute or ask a question? Otherwise, I'll go back to David Morgan for his second question. I can't see anybody hands up or waving. Um, so, David. Yeah, I will ask a second question. I know I sent you a few questions in the email, uh, Paul. I, I guess it daunted you a bit. They were just to help uh, if there's any lulls in proceedings. I don't like to sit... Uh, I didn't want any silences to emerge. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask about the uh, role of uh, the solidarity action, because this is a big part of the book. Uh, how do you assess the uh, contribution of communists to keeping the memory of the Republic alive and to their solidarity action? I remember uh, Bruce Kent always used to go around, he was talking about CND, of course, used to go around saying it was the Quakers and the communists who kept the peace movement alive. To what extent is that true of the uh, solidarity action to, to keep the memory of Spain alive? And obviously, with uh, the fact that Franco was in power for so long, what solid solid solidarity actions took place after the fall of the Republic? and to, to help uh, refugees and exile, political exiles, et cetera. If you can say something of that, I'm sure it'd be quite enlightening for us, given that you've been researching for possibly, what is it, 50 years on this topic. Thank you anyway, again. Obviously things were, there wasn't much going on during the Second World War. The rest of the world was well, um, a bit busy. Of um, course. <laughs> and it, it, but after the after 1945, um, it's certainly the case that um, the International Brigade Association, um, as was, um, did you know did, did a lot, um, and then later on, of course, the um, I mean, the whole history of how the International Brigade Association. Um, evolved into the International Brigade Memorial Trust is a, a, a lengthy story. But um, I think people remember, I think that the, the, the Spanish Civil War was long remembered as you know, the last great cause. And um, so much of the literature that um, came out, um, you know, both fictional literature and historical works did a lot to keep to keep the, the the memory alive. I mean, the fact that you know at the end of the nineteen sixties, Hugh Thomas's book, The Spanish Civil War, was a monumental international bestseller. Was I think a reflection of of, of popular hunger for um, you know information ab about the Civil War. Um, I mean, to to give you a full answer, I'd I'd need to think about it, but I I think there was a, an awful lot. I mean, there were there were cinematic um, reflections, I think, but again, um, got to remember, I'm very old and my memory isn't what it was, but um, you just have to believe me. OK, thanks. There's a comment um, in the chat from Harold Heckel about the role of Sir Henry Chilton, uh, the British diplomat who uh, moved uh, from his position to collaborating to help Spanish Re Republican refugees board Royal Navy ships, um, which leads me on to what was going to be my question, which is to what extent did the Labour Party officially in, in Britain uh, help to get Republican uh, Republicans out, um, either during or, or after the Civil War, uh, compared, for example, uh, with the Labour Party's sort of intervention in getting um, 
you know, refugees out of Austria in 1934 when they actually sent an official delegation and also um, the Labour Party's uh, sort of group who were involved in, in getting German and Czech um, socialists and communists out of Prague in 1938 and 1939. Was there a similar programme and use of the kind of International Solidarity Fund uh, by the Labour Party during the Spanish Civil War? During the war, um, obviously there were there were lots of initiatives um, that I think were you know, reflected in movement like the Aid Spain movement mm. and so on. A lot of humanitarian aid. Um, it gets it it kind of gets quite murky at the end. I mean, obviously the Labour Party was in opposition, so it had very little power. And one of the things that um, I, you know, I believe that the, and I try to demonstrate that I particularly demonstrate this in in my book, the last days of, of the Spanish Republic, where the, you know, I think the conservative party, you know, the British government of the day, was complicit in um, the fate of hundreds of thousands of, of Spanish refugees, you know, Republican refugees. The Labour Party could not have done anything to stop that happening. But there are, you know, there are individual examples during the war of um, Labour Party individuals, um, you know, or people affiliated to, to, the, to the Labour Party who went to massive efforts to, um, to help the Republic. But I mean, some of these questions require books of their own you know, to answer adequately. Yes, I mean, my comment was really the Labour Party had a sort of a very official role and sent delegations um, to get people out in the previous, the two other instances. But um, as you say, I think in the case of Spain, it was humanitarian groups and individual socialists and, and Republican sympathisers rather than official Labour Party support. I mean, is that a correct understanding? Yes, I think that's 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 reasonable, but it is a very very complicated issue. So it's not, you know, it's not it's not possible to sum it up in you know, headlines. Okay, fair enough. Um, Sid Lowe, you're next. Hi, Paul. I I I've got quite a basic question, really, which is. Why Britain? After years dedicating um, your time to looking at Spain and researching Spain from from the inside, so I mean looking looking outwards, what what is it that made you decide this time to go to it from a from a British perspective to look at it kind of back looking back at Spain rather than out from Spain? Well, I think it, it's it's been festering for quite a long time. Um, and obviously, one of the themes of my work over, over the years has been the international dimension of the war. And I've obviously done uh, quite a lot on the contribution of Italian fascism to, to helping the Republic and then the intervention of, of Mussolini in many different respects. Um, obviously, the, the same I would say vis-a-vis -vis, um, Nazi Germany, and I've always, I, I mean, particularly in ev events like this in Spain, <laughs> where I've been kind of pushed on the, on this issue, you know, was it just was it just them? But of course, I had to, you know, I, I had to look into the fact that. Um, Arms procurement was, you know, thanks to British policy, was almost, you know, legitimate arms procurement was prevented for the Republic and easily facilitated for the rebels. You know, as I said earlier in answer to, to another question, um, there are plenty of, of um, 
the documentary sources to show that um, the, the Italian policymakers were absolutely convinced that whatever they did would be tacitly approved by the British government. Um, so um, the I mean, one of the one of the, the interesting things actually that um, in, in I mean, both stuff I've published about um, Mussolini and the Spanish Civil War, but also in my biography of Franco, is the revealing meeting that takes place in January 1937 um, in in Italy between Mussolini himself and Goering. And they are fulminating about how dreadful they think Franco is as a strategist and why he's so slow. Now, Franco was slow for a very specific reason, but which I can go into if anyone wants me to. And uh, but basically, Goering says, we've got to make him hurry up because if he if he doesn't, there is no way the British are going to let us get away with this. And of course, he completely misjudges that, you know, if you like, the pusillanimity of appeasement. And as I said earlier on, you know, one of the, the, the central objectives of Hit, you know, the, the motives of Hitler and Mussolini is to undermine Anglo-British hegemony of international relations. And in order to um, illustrate this further, I thought I'd put together a number of chapters that um, you know that, that that illustrated that particular um, you know that, that particular facet of things. And I mean, it's something I have been. It's not entirely new. Um, I mean, you, you and I have been sparring for you know, enough years for you to know that. Is there, is there, I mean, but is there a, a, a kind of a contemporary push here? I mean, I, I don't know if you are kind of partly looking at the way British politics is going now. And there's, there's almost a kind of an internal desire to, I don't know, to give some back, perhaps, a, a, a kind of the venality of, of, of just how bad British politics has become. Does, is that kind of implicitly somewhere in the back of your mind in this? Well, I, I, I mean, the, the way you just put it, and I can't believe this is what you mean, is that there's something audible, or oh, sorry, laudable, <laughs> certainly audible, something laudable about present British foreign policy. No, 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 no. When, completely opposite, completely opposite. That's what that's what I'm asking. Right. Is, is, is it the the the, right. the, 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 the sort mean, of my, grotesque, my grotesque this, nature of it does that for you? Simultaneous, simultaneously with this event, I have put an article on um, a new Labour website called Labour Hub, mm -hmm. in which I it, it, it's called the Mutual Revelations of Past and Present, and it's about how the past exposes, you know, can, can expose, you know, things that. I, I would venture to say that certain members of the present cabinet would not want revealed. Um, and of course, the other way around that, um, you know, I openly admit that. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it starts off saying that it's, it's, it's one of the mantras of most, his, you know, historical teaching. All history is contemporary history. And I trace back, you know, where, where, where these thoughts come from. Um, and basically, it's <laughs> it's Marx is um, is certainly one of the um, the people that um, it, the, the, the the axiom of Marx, you know, about uh, history repeating itself. You know, first, of, you know, I, I suggest that. Uh, it would be very good for the Tory party to take note of that. But yeah, okay. I mean, it, it, there is a contemporary motive, but um, there were lots of personal motivations 
in doing this book. Um, and as I started off saying at the beginning of this event, you know, I, I, I wanted to say what a great outfit the Clapton Press is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank, thanks. Uh, promotion for the, for the the publisher who do some very interesting books. I have to say, having seen other other books they've produced, and it's great to see small publishers uh, publishing this kind of substantive uh, material. Um, Steve Cushion, you were next. Uh, yes, uh, some of the research I've done has been into the uh, the French Resistance and the importance of uh, veterans of both the international brigades. Mm. Uh, the the uh, uh, particularly the uh, 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 the Germans uh, uh, and Italians and the uh, uh, the exiled uh, Republican soldiers who who were interned in camps but escaped uh, in the French Resistance uh, you know sort of makes me wonder if you have got any thoughts about the uh, uh, the ongoing uh, nature of the, that kind of that international war against fascism uh, from the bottom up, as it were, you know, that kind of people's war aspect of the, the Second World War. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I was quite surprised to discover that. I mean, there were there was something like there was something like 30,000 Spanish guerrillas in the hills around Toulouse uh, by 1944. Uh, and you know, that that that's a, a not insignificant force. So, uh, you know, uh, I just wondered if you've, you know, sort of uh, got any any thoughts on, you, on the kind of post-war. If you were surprised or, or by the... that, yeah. if you were surprised by that, it wasn't half as surprised as I was when I found out that there were actually Frenchmen in the French resistance. <laughs> it is very much my conviction that the French resistance was made possible by it was, I mean, being being frivolous, which is called contra, con, entirely contrary to my nature, I would suggest that the French Resistance was the Spanish Republican Army on tour. That um, it, it was the experience, you know, the fact that there were you know, experienced fighters of you know, the, the Spanish Republic who had. Um, you know, were imprisoned. If we were in concentration camps in France, um, not a term that um, most French experts on this welcome, but th that was what made the, you know the beginning of the French resistance possible. And you know, the the fact that you know um, the the forces that that took. Um, that took Paris were actually le led by members of the of, of you know of the, the Spanish Republican Army. The you know the the armored cars of Leclerc's you know forces that that um, enter, entered Paris had were emblazoned with terminology that referred to the the Spanish Civil War um, and in fact um, there was only one person well I'm not going to go as, as, as I keep saying the answers to most of these questions would keep me occupied for hours so let's just leave it at that I I believe that the um, the, the the Spanish, you know, Spanish Republicans played a very major, not to say decisive, part in the French Resistance, and indeed, you know, they they also played a part in the defence of British forces at Dunkirk. They were involved in Narvik, you know, the the, the and the, I'm not the only person to be saying this, but. Um, Spanish Republican exiles played a, ma a major role um, in the Second World War in the, in the struggle. Um, you know, they it was their war, and they went on fighting it until Hitler was defeated. 
Thanks. As I can't see any other hands up, um, I'll pick up a, a question from David Gamby, which is in the chat. Is there any evidence about what the Labour Party policy towards Spain would have been if they had been in government? That's always a fairly speculative question as we're asking what an opposition party would do in government, as we, we, we know very well in the current situation. I mean, I think it should be recognised that the Labour Party, at least in terms of conference decisions, did move away from um, a position of supporting non-intervention to a position of at least uh, some form of solidarity with the Spanish government and the Republicans. But do you want to say more on that, Paul? I think I'd rather not, in the <laughs> sense that uh, great admirer, as I am, of Clement Attlee, I have some quite um, critical uh, views on Bevan's foreign policy, which if anyone would care to find out more about, um, they can be seen in my biography of Franco. Okay, there's also no, a question. I mean, apart from the fact, you know, sorry, let me just say, apart from the fact that I don't do counter the fact, you know, <laughs> what if is, is uh, you know, it, it's like the professional historian's equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. There is no point go, go in there, you know. It, it, it's it, 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 it's a point. It's a pointless activity. But um, I my views on labor la labor foreign policy at the time. I mean, were not um, they, they were not favorable to the anti Franco resistance. Put it that way. Mm. That's a good report, reply but on avoiding maybe, hypothesis. Know, for, for understandable reasons, <laughs> perhaps given the Cold War context. Okay, there's uh, a question uh, again in chat from Jonathan Sherry. Could you say something about the efforts of Yuan Negrin to end the British non-intervention and also perhaps comment on how Negrin has been remembered in particular his relation to the communists. Well, this is again is a, a a very a very big big question. Um, the book I mentioned earlier, the last days of the Spanish Republic, is, if you like, uh, a manifestation of my great admiration for Juan Negrin, who was the, I think, one of the great. Spanish states, sorry, great Spanish statesman of, of, of the last hundred years, and um, a much mis misunderstood figure. Um, and his, you know, he, everything that he was trying to do was undermined by the Munich Agreement when. At that point, of course, um, the Spanish Republic was betrayed um, by the farce of um, you know what, what 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 you know when Chamberlain returned to London, waving his piece of paper, proclaiming peace in our time. Very interesting that Edward Heath, who at the time um, was it was in the Conservative Party, but um, was a great sympathizer of the Spanish Republic. And he declared in a, a famous speech that what Chamberlain had done was he had um, shown all four cheeks to Hitler. And I mean, the efforts of, of, of Negrin. Uh, for instance, why ne Negrin was, if you like, st stymied at all turns. I mean, he was overthrown as uh, president of the, oh, sorry, as prime minister of the of, of the Spanish Republic um, in at the beginning of March of 1939, and thereby all of his plans to. Um, arrange evacuation for refugees and so on, 
were prevented by the, the, the traitor, um, Colonel Mundo Casado, who managed to project uh, an image of himself as the great, as, as the man who was trying to prevent endless slaughter, when virtually everything he did ensured that there would be far greater slaughter than there would have been had Negrin remained in power. But that's, you know, that, that, that's a controversial uh, view. Um, I acknowledge that it is. And if uh, anyone cares to see how I argue it, then I urge them to have a look at my book, The Last Days of the Spanish Republic. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, there's a, a comment uh, in the chat from Linda Ray uh, referring to Adam Hochschild's new book, Spain in Our Hearts, on the role of uh, American uh, volunteers supporting the Republican government. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Paul, on Hochschild's perspective? I think it's, it's a really in interesting book, um, and it, it sort of perpetuates... Um, you know the the memory in in the United States of the efforts made by uh, members of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, not as most American writers call it, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Um, the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, like the British Battalion, was merely a part of the 5th Brigade, but anyway, that's, um, that's another story. But no, it, it, it's, it's a, a wonderful, readable, useful, valid book, yes. So I, I'm very happy to applaud um, Adam Hochschild's book. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I don't... Think, I think there's a... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I think if anyone cares to have a look, there's a there's a, a quote on the back of the book <laughs> to that effect. OK, I'm sure you endorsed it. Um, right, I can't see any hands up, so this is the last chance for questions. Firstly, anybody who hasn't spoken yet. I can't see anybody. Um, David, did you have one last question? Well, I don't know if I'll, I'll raise any more questions at this stage. <laughs> OK, I was just giving uh, you the, ch the chance because I saw uh, you on this. Uh, I just want to make a quick, brief comment. Uh, when I first came to London in 1985, I, was, I had the privilege of meeting Bill Alexander, mm -hmm. who was one of the leaders of the British uh, Batal Brigade or Battalion. And uh, I just wonder if uh, Paul, uh, Paul, Paul must have known him and what, what he thought of, it, of his of his uh, efforts to keep the memory of uh, the, the uh, Civil War alive and the role of the British uh, uh, communists and all those who uh, took part in that uh, great uh, uh, struggle against fascism. And also Tony Atienza, who was our chairman for a while. I think you must have known as well. Ch chairman of the Socialist. Yes, I, I was, I, I was privileged to know... Sorry. <laughs> No, it's over to you. Yeah. Is it all right to answer? Yeah, carry on, Paul. I'll I'll mute David. Yeah, he's muted himself. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say I I was privileged to know Bill Alexander and quite a few of the um, surviving uh, brigadiers. Um, and I, I've known them since, um, like, well, not that long, um, from the uh, from the late seventies, I guess. Um, and I suppose what would I would say something that was true about them individually, as was true of. Many communists that I met, of Spanish communists that I met when I was doing my research um, on the anti Franco struggle and so on, which was a kind of strange contrast between 
incredible personal warmth and sympathy and a kind of hardline um, Stalinism in terms of the, um, mm. you know, some, some of it, it perhaps inevitable. Um, I, I, that wasn't true of all of them, but it was, um, Bill was, um, I, I thought, an absolutely wonderful human being, but um, he was, he could be quite, um, shall we say, belligerent um, on matters to do with the memory of, of, of the Civil War. Um, he has a, 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 an article, for instance, he has an article about Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, which um, I think is rather wonderful, but it is, it is excoriating. Okay, Paul, uh, any final comments from you? No, I, I feel I've let you all down um, in the sense that I wasn't on very great good, good form today for a, a variety of reasons I won't bore you with. Um, and I hope there might be a next time in which I'll try to do better. I wouldn't apologise. That was really good. And you get really full answers to all the questions coming from a range of directions. So uh, no need to apologise at all. That was excellent. And we really appreciate the time you spent. Um, and we obviously look forward to any future events and future books you're working on. Thank you. <laughs> OK, uh, thanks. Before we close, um, just to remind uh, people um, from your names, many of you aren't members of the Socialist History Society. Um, so, so do join. Um, there's also, as I say, on the screen, the Clapton Press promo for the book and very much thanks to, to Clapton Press for publishing this. I know they're with us during the session because I gather it was their idea we had this session. So thank you. Um, our next event is 15th of April online again, uh, 7 p.m. Andrew Whitehead on a devilish kind of courage, uh, which is on uh, Latvian revolutionaries and the si Sydney Street siege in London uh, before the First World War. And there are other events we're planning, uh, including uh, later. You mentioned the AGM. Yeah. Well, shall I mention? Well, do you want to mention the AGM? Uh, yeah, I'll, have... I'll quick, quickly mention the AGM because that's going to be in person on the at Max House, Max Mora Library, on the afternoon of the first of June. Now, as yet, we've not got a speaker signed up. But watch this space. <laughs> we might do something on the anniversary of the miners' strike, or it might be something totally different. But the AGM will take place in person on the 1st of June. Thank you, everyone. So see it, those of you then that are SHS members and those who you will join in the next half hour or so, having uh, participated. Anyone can in come this along event. to the talk. Yeah, anybody can come along to the talk. Obviously, only SHS members can vote uh, on the committee and and any constitutional matters of the SHS. Well, we certainly welcome contributions from you to the newsletter. Um, tell us what you're doing, what books uh, you're, you're writing, what research you're undertaking, or even suggestions of speakers, because we try and have a very wide range of speakers. Um, and with due respect to, uh, to Paul and many of our uh, elderly colleagues, uh, we were very keen on having uh, some more younger speakers and a better gender balance as well. That's not to say that uh, el elderly men are not good at writing history, but others are as well. So uh, do do participate and keep in touch. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And this this will go um, on the Socialist History Society website as soon as um, uh, Steve has uh, 